Hey everyone, so I'm back uh, trying to do this video lecture one more time. I'm also on baby duty right now, so we'll see how well this goes. I might have to pause in the middle of it, but um, just trying to get this done as quickly as possible so this is the right time. Um, so the purpose of this video is to be kind of like a bridge video between the uh, getting started uh, course um, tour kind of welcome to the class kind of video that I made and already posted and we had that quiz for and those uh, two um, videos I made on the Code of Intellectual Conduct for my 101 students a year a year ago in that hybrid course which I have now posted the links for too so this is gonna this is gonna kinda bridge the gap and also uh, cover material that I was just giving a sneak preview of uh, in that other video the intro video the tour video about the um, intro lecture which I incidentally have right here for us to take a look at right there there it is. Um, we will ooh, we will uh, go take a look at that in a little second here. But to pick up kind of the thread from that uh, tour video that you've already watched, hopefully, um, and get us into this lecture is that idea that I mentioned about how uh, I like to say that critical reasoning is a uh, ethical paradigm. So. What do I mean by that, and and why do I think that that's something that needs to be uh, emphasized? Um, the main motivation that I see uh, comes from how I've seen critical reasoning classes taught in the past, and and just how I've seen um, this facet of critical reasoning as a part of philosophical instruction. And the thing that I'm sensitive to is about how. Uh, there are some things that we can take for granted from the world of philosophy. A academic philosophy as a culture, just like any uh, community of people that get together for some kind of cooperative purpose. Science has got this too. I mean, there's been countless sociological studies of the culture of scientific communities and how they work. Same is true with philosophy too. Philosophers try really hard to be um, universally minded, to be considering all of the things that aren't universal, to be on guard against bias, to be in conversation with everyone, blah, blah, blah. But uh, we're still human beings and we still can slip into taking certain things for granted. And one of those things I think is critical reasoning. I've, I've seen um, this kind of informal logic class taught where, or even just when this kind of material gets brought into any philosophy class, like say a philosophy 101 class, uh, it's just kind of taken for granted that, uh, duh, this is how reason works. You know, this is how to live. This is the right way to have discourse with other people. And <clears throat> I definitely think that there's a lot that is pretty awesome about critical reasoning. And as a paradigm, it's very useful. Uh, and, you know, we'll talk about all the virtues here in a second. But I think it's good to recognize that uh, what what kind of function does critical reasoning play? Well, it's a set of tools and techniques and methods that are ultimately deployed for the sake of figuring out what to think and how to act and that's it and the fact is we have other ways other than critical reasoning for how to make those choices for how to decide what we're going to think and how we're going to act so um, what would be the argument that would justify doing this versus those other techniques um, the fact that it is giving guidance though about um, how to think and how to act, or how to make those decisions, um, means right there for me it's an ethical paradigm. That's what ethics is all about. It's about how should we act, how should we live. Our behavior with regard to belief is um, it's a type of behavior. Uh, I actually was uh, reading an article about a woman who's been kind of going around different cities in the south trying to create uh, dialogue or opportunities like forums for dialogue about race. And uh, she, she was saying, there was like a little sound bite from her that said something like, um, she's like, only cheap talk is cheap in sort of response to like, you know, you shouldn't, you can't just be talking about stuff. You got to do something, you know, talk is cheap, but actions are what really matter. And I kind of sympathize with her a little bit in saying, you know, not that we shouldn't be doing all those other things, because of course, action matters. Like uh, Aristotle says about ethics, he's like, uh, we don't care to study ethics so that we can know it. We want to know it so that we can do it, so we can live it, so we can live better lives. That's the whole point. So action is the end. The part that I am a little sympathetic with here is that thinking and talking, debating, is a type of activity. And as an activity, it's got ethical considerations like any other activity. Um, and we'll talk about that. But that's what 
um, it puts it in the ethical camp for me because it is giving us a pretty um, specific set of guidelines and advice about how to go about living with respect to things like belief and adjudicating disagreement and all that good stuff. Hey, how's it going? You doing okay? You doing okay? <laughs> Let's keep going. So, um, I like to acknowledge this. And it's not just as like a little disclaimer or caveat. Um, the reason why I think that would matter to talk about and the reason I'm talking about in an intro lecture to a class on it on the subject is because I think it's good for us to go into this open-minded like I was saying I'm concerned about um, taking the paradigm of critical reasoning for granted and if we're going to think about critical reasoning critically and reason about it which we should be doing if we think it is something that matters we should be looking to try to understand um, or explore what might be the limits of this kind of paradigm. What are the things that can go bad in addition to what are the things that can go good? And when I teach this class in a brick and mortar setting um, in a classroom, ooh. Hmm. Pardon me. You alright? Um, when I teach this in a like on campus class setting, uh, usually on the first day, um, after doing some preliminary stuff, um, I try to have this little class discussion that you can see here in the <clears throat> the intro lecture lecture notes that I got posted up there. Here they are. We can take a look at them. Where I ask uh, my students, "What do you think of, or what reactions do you have to this idea of being critical and using reasoning?" So what I'm really sort of asking here is like, um, you can imagine being critical as a way of being of orienting toward the world and you can imagine orienting to the world um, at, through a reliance on reason I, I actually like separating the two here of critical reasoning because they kind of they come with their own baggage each one of them individually you can imagine someone who's critical who is not necessarily using rationality as a part of that criticism um, <clears throat> and you can imagine someone who you know relies on reason a lot and uses it as a tool but not, doesn't necessarily do that critically. Now, they definitely kind of go together like two peas in a pod. There, there's a lot of synergy, you, if you will, uh, between being critical and using rationality. But they can come apart, and they each kind of bring something different to the table. So I like to ask my students, you know, in your experience with these things, if you're imagining, like, different ways that you could be living your life and making decisions, um, what might lead you to be drawn toward uh, doing it in this way, like adopting a critical attitude toward the world or using rationality and relying on it? And what are the things that you might hesitate on that might um, be outstanding concerns or that give you pause or cause you to hesitate in, in really putting your stock in this way of engaging with the world? Um, and so we kind of make a list. This, the list I got here in the intro lecture of answers I've received in the past is by no means exhaustive. Um, I've taught this class so many times, and there's so many answers. I just I haven't updated the notes in a while because uh, you sometimes you just have the discussion. But here's some of the ones that I've gotten from students in the past, and, and I want you to think about it too for yourself. Um, where do you come from in thinking about critical reasoning, and what's been your experience with it? You probably have some things um, hanging around in the back of your mind that are things that are um, concerns that you bring to the table. If there's a if you're going to get into a debate with someone, um, you may not be thinking about them explicitly, but they kind of they're in the background. They set a context. They frame your experience and feelings about what's happening, and guide your interpretations. And I think it's good to have some awareness about that. I, I mentioned in a previous post that um, I'm I'm really concerned before we get into the dry nuts and bolts of the class to remember that these are they're going to be human beings who are the critical reasoners. Um, that there's a humanity that's behind all these sorts of dry analytic principles and logical formulas and patterns and all that kind of stuff. Um, and even though most of our, the class is not going to be spent on this kind of hippy-dippy stuff, uh, I think it's really good to have it on the back burner um, to keep that context in mind. Uh, I love to joke that, you know, in certain situations, employing... Uh, you know, giving someone an argument is not the answer. Sometimes people need hugs instead of arguments. Um, that's that's the jokey way to put it. But the the more serious point is that there may be limits um, and boundaries to when this way of engaging with the world is the right way to engage with the world. And maybe there's room for other ways to do it too. We'd have to critically reason about that, you might say. And I'd be like, that's fair. Let's do that. 
but let's integrate what critical reasoning has to offer with these other things that we can be concerned about. Um, you'll see that reflected in the Code of Intellectual Conduct because right from the beginning it's saying we are trying to find some rules here that help us get at the truth and treat each other and ourselves ethically. We care about both of those things. So um, in a similar way here, I like to you know, widen the view a little bit and see what other things we're trying to balance. Um, to, I'm not, I'm not going to kind of go over all these things in super great detail. You can look at the lecture notes here and, and see what's happening and think about it, how you'd answer it for yourself. But as I kind of mentioned in the um, intro lecture, the, the ultimate punchline for all of this, the reason to have, like the, where the things go after we have this discussion about what are the things we might, what are the risks that we're worried about with critical, being critical and using rationality, and what are the possible benefits, then the next question is, you know, might, even though there's some big boundaries around critical reasoning's appropriateness, maybe we could expand that area if we were doing it in a certain way. That is, maybe we could find um, some boundaries or constraints about how we critically reason that would help us enjoy all those positive potential benefits and dodge the potential risks. Um, I do think with most of the things that get associated good and bad with critical reasoning, they're not absolute or guaranteed. They're, they're just risks. They're possibilities. It doesn't have to look that way. It doesn't have to necessarily create the good things that we're hoping for. It doesn't necessarily have to mean the bad things we might be fearing. Um, but we have to think about that too and try to figure out what are the boundaries for that. And one attempt to answer that question of how we can constrain ourselves in these contexts of, of disagreement, which we're going to explore through rational debate, uh, is this code of intellectual conduct. And so that's where my other videos will pick up and kind of go from there. Um, so, um, whoa, buddy. Been swirling around. Hey, hey, hey. There, I'm going to pause it for a second. All right, so I'm back. Thanks for your patience um, with that little pause. Uh, I guess it wasn't any kind of wait for you because you're just watching the video. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of the lead-in for the code of intellectual conduct, or what kind of frames it is that, you know, we don't just critical reasoning is not just this one thing. There's different ways that we could go about it, and we can be balancing some of these considerations to try to get the good without the bad. That's the hope. And in, I use the Code of Intellectual Conduct in a lot of my classes. Um, like, you, those videos are from my 101 class. I'm teaching an ethics course right now. We're talking about it. I, I like to use it a lot. It's pretty relevant for this class because this is what we're kind of all about. Are like, what are, the, what are the rules for best practice here when it comes to being critical reasoners? But in a, kind of an interesting way, it's even more... Uh, important to talk about it in those other classes. I actually tell my students in those classes, um, you know, th think of this like a contract. I'd like us to have some kind of consensus about what we're pledging to each other about how we're going to behave in debate and discussion so that we can um, have those be as productive and not abusive and negative and terrible, but that we can actually talk about things that matter um, do that kind of critical inquiry, do some truth-seeking, and also be respectful and treat each other properly and get the best chance of getting at the truth. Um, so um, in those other classes where we're sometimes talking and having debates around some pretty loaded things, especially like an ethics course, it's a big deal. In this class, uh, this class is not a debate course. You're, we're not going to really be having um, activities where you, you know, have some kind of mock debate with each other. In fact, I actually am trained in ethics bowl and, and mock debate um, in grad school. I took some training courses for that. and It's not my favorite way to teach philosophy because I think making it into a kind of sport or competition is exactly the opposite of what um, is the right way to think about critical reasoning and definitely goes against the picture that the Code of Intellectual Conduct is painting. Um, a fun little anecdote on this. I'm the faculty advisor at BC for the philosophy club. And we are able to, we talk about things like the code of intellectual conduct is kind of like framing how we talk with each other. And, and every once in a while we've had a member of the debate team come to philosophy club and they have a little bit of culture shock because we're not doing things the way like the, the professional or competitive debate does it. Um, it's much more charitable, collaborative, cooperative rather than, like I, I still remember one time where a student from debate came into the club and you know we were just having this kind of like friendly conversation throwing different ideas around 
and they're like furiously taking notes the whole time and then they're like raising their hand to speak and we're like yeah go for it and they just rattle off all these objections in like five minutes that they had to everything that was being said with like no gaps or spaces or anything it was just like bam 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 and we're like all right let's, <laughs> let's time out let's talk about this a little bit um so i i'm like i've said i say in that other video too on the code of intellectual conduct i think the whole whole thing can really be summed up with uh, sh having a paradigm shift from uh, debate as a competitive activity where there are winners and losers you're trying to you have an opponent who is your enemy um, that you're trying to defeat and a, a cooperative collaborative model where your enemy your your opponent is not your enemy they're your actual closest ally the person who is going to help you achieve your goal better than anyone else can um, that goal of, of getting at the truth and holding your own beliefs accountable as well as critically evaluating the other options that are out there um, for what to believe and how to act. So a little bit of background there. Um, but I also I want to take this opportunity um, to also talk about something that's kind of related to this. So um, I gave a talk at a conference a couple years back. There's a um, there's this conference called the Plato Conference, which is a conference for philosophy educators in the state of Washington to get together and talk about teaching and philosophy and, and pedagogy and stuff like that. And uh, we hosted at BC a couple years back, and I gave a talk at that installment of the conference about teaching critical reasoning. And I'm just going to you know talk about my talk a little bit here and lay some of my cards on the table. Uh, you'll get a better idea of kind of how I approach teaching this stuff. and um, and leave you with some some things that I think are useful to have on the radar in thinking about human beings engaging in critical reasoning with each other. So I, in that talk, I did mention this stuff about how I like to acknowledge critical reasoning as an ethical paradigm, and it's something that not everyone is encultured to, and that there are some things that we need to have on our radar um, in presenting it uh, to students and inviting them to participate with it. And I think this is true even for uh, professional philosophers who are uh, maybe thinking or believing that they already know how this works and and they're comfortable with it and everything. I, I think there's there's some real reasons, some real legitimate reasons, some realities behind how um, being engaging in critical reasoning is uh, not something that's comfortable for everybody uh, for for very legitimate concerns. It can be overwhelming. It can be scary. Um, it can feel risky. It, you can feel vulnerable. There's all sorts of things going on here. And in the talk that I gave, I used um, some other philosophical work to try to uh, argue for and justify uh, the kind of concern I had about this and, and some of my recommendations about how to deal with it, um, how to how to be responsive to these concerns. Here, I'm just going to put this guy down for a little while. I think he's ready to go. All right. I think he's doing good down there. It's your first time on YouTube. <laughs> it actually is his first time on YouTube. Um, okay, so I was pulling a lot from this um, 20th century German existentialist kind of slash theologian. I mean, he is a theologian, but he's he's definitely not just only about religion. He's he's definitely a philosopher, philosopher as well. And uh, he was he was kicked out of Nazi Germany. So his heyday, he came to America and his heyday was kind of the 50s and 60s. And there's a time period where uh, his book, The Courage to Be, is kind of Matt, uh, one of his most famous books, was on like a lot of philosophy 101 reading lists across the country in all colleges and universities. So uh, he was kind of a big deal for a little while. But he also was incidentally the first philosopher I ever read in high school. I got a hold of Courage to Be in high school and it made a kind of an, a lasting impact on me. In fact, sometimes I'm like, is that my idea or is that Tillich's idea? And I just forgot I got it from him. But uh, this, in this particular case, I'm, I can credit him. I know this idea is from him and not from me. But in The Courage to Be, Tillich is talking about, um, he's kind of tracing the uh, development of our concept of courage through history all the way back to ancient Greece. So he's definitely covering only the Western world here. Um, at Western civilization, but he's going all the way back to pre-Socratics in ancient Greece and how they thought about courage and how that's kind of changed all the year, over the years all the way up to the 20th century. Um, and he sort of making, he's making a, 
philosophical historical narrative that these different forms of courage emerge to deal with different what he calls anxieties of non-being. Now he, he thinks there's been kind of a historical narrative about it, but he actually thinks that all of these anxieties are basic to human beings. So, he, and this may be a little controversial claim, but he thinks that these things are uh, not culturally specific. There are different cultures might put some more or less attention on them, but at least Tillich argues that, and he might be wrong about this, but he argues that these are um, these anxieties of non-being that he's talking about are basic to life. That even if you're not thinking about them or directly addressing them, or maybe if you don't particularly feel them, they're still available to be concerned about. So um, there have been some cynical voices I can think of. They're like, if you're not in despair, that just means you're blind. There, you maybe have heard sort of sentiments like that before. Um, there there might be some basic aspects to being a human being in a body in this world in time and having a mind and everything that creates affordances for certain forms of anxieties and I, I'll, I'll kind of stop short the rest of the philosophy lecture here but uh, he has got these three forms of anxiety the rest of those details don't matter as much for my purposes here the big the big thing is that of uh, is these three um, anxieties about non-being that he talks about and I think critical reasoning kind of presses all those buttons in us and that's one of the reasons why um, sometimes thinking about getting into a debate with someone is something you might be you might feel nervous about um, very understandably so I think and this is one of the reasons why um, so let's talk about let's talk about these three sources of anxiety some will probably sound a little familiar um, and this, this by no means is necessarily an exhaustive list. Tillich doesn't make that claim, but he does think that they're all basic. So the first one is anxiety about death and destruction. So this includes not, not just the fact that you are mortal and you will die and you won't necessarily know what's going to happen after you die, but also this sort of uh, fact of entropy about the world, that uh, nothing lasts forever, that everything that's good will go away, and everything that you're attached to has inevitable uh, will be inevitably ripped from your grasp and you'll lose it and that's something that you might be afraid of you might be afraid of the suffering that that will inspire <coughs> pardon me again hmm. um, the Buddhist in me is like wants to go on a big tangent about attachment and suffering and anxiety but I'm not gonna do that I'm gonna keep this short and sweet um, so death and destruction, that's one source of anxiety. It's kind of non-being in as much as things go out of existence. Um, either the something dies or something decays and isn't what it was before. So that's one, one thing of a uh, source of anxiety. Another one, second one, Tillich calls uh, anxiety about um, meaninglessness and inauthenticity. Anybody? So what are we talking about with anxiety around meaninglessness and inauthenticity? Um, Oh, here, give me a second. Okay, I think we're good for the time being. We'll see. We'll see how long this lasts. Um, so, anxiety around meaninglessness and inauthenticity. What are we talking about? Um, on the one hand, there's kind of meaninglessness, like uh, maybe the thought that everything is futile or something like that. And that's different from the first source of anxiety, like that things will all go away or something. That might be a source of futility, but you also just might be like, I don't want to lose that. You know, I have a fear of losing it. When we're talking about futility, maybe more like the this would might be a good example. You know how when you were younger you cared about certain things and you maybe valued them really highly, and then as you get older, yeah, you know, maybe not all of those things, but some of those things you're like, yeah, that wasn't really valuable. There really wasn't any point to that. Um, and maybe you're like, well, I was a child then, so I forgive myself for that. But it would be like, maybe think um, if there's a certain stretch of your adult life where you're like, I thought this was really important, really wasn't, was meaningless that sort of notion of futility that um, it's for nothing or it's a waste or um, it really is empty or something like that um, there's that kind of there's that kind of anxiety about meaninglessness but there's also some other ones too like that maybe get more into this inauthenticity aspect um, Tillich like uh, I, the existentialist I called him an existential philosopher he definitely is existentialists are kind of a weird bunch because unlike other isms in philosophy, like existentialism, um, there isn't really a, a strong uh, 
mm, agreement between all the philosophers we label as existentialists. They don't share like core thesis or very much. I mean, it's really hard to find the connections. They're such a diverse group, and they have opinions that are directly opposed to what the other existentialist philosophers think is is the right way to um, understand reality and experience and stuff. Um, but the one thing that kind of ties them together is that even though they have all these different philosophical positions, they all agree about uh, that it, they, they all concern themselves with question about freedom and authenticity. Uh, what is an authentic life? What does that look like? You've maybe um, come up against some of this stuff uh, in like just growing up. Um, you know, you there might have had this moment where you were reflecting and you're like, I got a bunch of beliefs and values. Where did I get all those from? Oh yeah, maybe my parents or caregivers or the culture I was raised in or something like that. I'm like, is that really who I want to be? Like, these beliefs didn't come from me. They came because of this stuff that I didn't decide on. Like, I didn't get to choose who are my parents or, or how they raised me or what happened to me or where I was born. You don't get to decide those things, but they touch you and they affect your beliefs and your values and your motives and your emotions and those things all give rise to the kind of choices you make and what life you end up constructing and what kind of person you're becoming and you might uh, start to reflect on that and be like uh, that's not cool like I need to I need to make some choices about what I'm going to be I need to be intentional about my life you might think about that or you, there might be questions about ownership here but you could keep having those kinds of concerns you know, it's not just that you're like, okay, well, I'm going to make some of my own choices now, and then I'm like secure against that kind of fear. That anxiety can actually be really pervasive. Um, if you've ever felt the kind of like sickening anxiety about uh, maybe noticing that there's a sort of bias in your thinking and in your your uh, feeling or your actions, um, and you're like, how did that get that? I didn't want that. That's not me. That's not what I want to be, but that's what I, I'm being that's maybe what I am right now or who I've been um, there can there can still be those concerns about what is what is an authentic choice um, I've had the, these anxieties about uh, saying the context of relationships with people of like what does it mean to be a really sincere friend or partner um, what does it mean to like authentically care about somebody as opposed to something that's just sort of a veiled version of my own selfishness or something like that um, when people, if you're, if you um, have some experience uh, in a religious context, this is kind of some of the concern about idolatry, like what is genuine concern for God, and what is really just worshiping some kind of fake stand-in for God that's just what I want or something I've constructed and isn't what God, who God really is, or something like that. All those things, those are all examples of concerns about inauthenticity too. Um, and uh, that's kind of in the second category. So that's the second one. Um, I got to try. I'll try to move this along as much as I can. This stuff's so much fun to talk about. So I, sometimes I just get a little distracted with that. The third category is anxiety around um, moral culpability. This is a fear that I might be a bad person, um, or that the sins of my past are I'm not free from. Um, it might be like karmic attachment, and in the real sense, not in the like what co goes around comes around that's not really what the Buddhist notion of karma is all about if you curious about that I'll talk to you about it sometime if you want to email me or something but this is the like anxiety about whether I am not good um, whether I'm guilty of some kind of wrongdoing um, we want to be good people we want to do the right thing and um, if you're kind of like done in action and then you're like, oh man, that was wrong, and then it just racks at you, that's that kind of anxiety. So, okay, to move this thing along a little bit, I'm, I was talking about all these different sources of anxiety of non being because I think um, critical reasoning, this context of like a critical debate with another person, adjudicating disagreement through argument, kind of naturally presses on all those anxiety buttons. Um, in the first one, death and destruction. Um, and impermanence. If you go into a debate sincerely, there's the chance that you might not be able to defend your position, and you may have to leave the debate believing something that you didn't start with, or that you know we get attached to our beliefs. We don't want to change them a lot of the time. Sometimes we do, of course, but it's possible for us to become attached to them. We don't want to give them up. If if uh, I've got certain values and things I care about in my life, and then I engage in an open debate about about like what's really important or meaningful, what's the meaning of life, and 
I'm, and I'm like, wow, I can't defend my view. <laughs> There's no good arguments for, you know, I thought I had some good arguments, but maybe they got defeated with objection. I'm like, yeah, there's really not a lot of support there. And these other things, oh, those are, that's a, some really good arguments for why I should give a shit about that instead of this. Um, and I may, But I may not want to change. I might be slow to that. I might be resistant to it. I might want to hang on to the things that are familiar that I'm attached to. Beliefs and values can definitely be... Um, just as much of something that we attach to as um, possessions or sort of cultural stuff or anything like that in life. So um, so that's the first one. Second one, um, meaninglessness and inauthenticity. And if you think something is true or valuable and then you have to submit it to critical um, inquiry, there's always the risk that the skeptical objections went out. And you're like, if we're going to have a critical debate about how we ought to live, it might be that there's no defense of morality. That I mean, that's that's a possibility, or truth might be impossible to get at. This kind of skepticism. Um, there's no promises in critical reasoning that the debate is going to turn out the way that you want it to, and that might uh, make you have to stare into that uh, abyss, you know, of like the possibility of despair, or the possibility of meaninglessness, or the possibility of of there being no truth or something like that. I'm not saying those things are true. In fact, generally, I'm not much of I, I appreciate skepticism, but I'm not a, I don't uh, subscribe to a lot of these more extreme theses that are, are skeptical in nature, so I'm a little distracted here. Um, but I think that you have to confront it, and you can't just dogmatically say, if it's a really sincere, open, critical debate, that, well, of course, you know, that stuff is, of course the world is not meaningless. You, know, you, you have to actually take the threat of those things seriously. So you have to confront meaninglessness, that's one thing. But the other thing, especially on this issue of authenticity, I mean, when we submit our, our perspectives, our b beliefs, our values, our paradigms to critical inquiry, it might be revealed just maybe how little they stand on and how little we have put them on, like how much justification we have for our beliefs and our perspectives. Um, once we start facing down some objections, it could be hard to defend them. And so there, it can kind of push on those things of like, do I really have authentic and good enough or justifiable reasons for the perspectives I have. I mean, that's, am I really, uh, is, is the things that I'm defending things that I have chosen for good reason, or are they just arbitrary? And that's a, another kind of meaninglessness. Arbitrariness is another uh, place that meaninglessness can, can sneak in the door. So I think it pushes that button, and I think it especially pushes the button of, um, of moral culpability. Um, actually, when I was giving, when I did the first version of this lecture, I ended up talking a lot about this, so I'm going to try to be careful. But um, this is just Tim Lineman speaking right now, not your instructor, no authority. It's just an observation I made. I could, I can be wrong about this, but in my um, observation of where we're at uh, in the communities I'm a part of in America today, and what happens in our culture as I witness it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of startled by a weird uh, sort of asymmetry that I've noticed. When it comes to other moral mistakes like uh, being a bad friend or lying or cheating or, or even, even sometimes um, being mean or abusive, bullying, terrible things, we don't always do this, but there's, there's some kind of narrative in place or model in place for where people can ask for forgiveness and actually receive forgiveness and will be understanding of why people do some bad things. Maybe, you know, again, not always and and maybe not around certain things is that as common, but, you know, people can screw up quite a bit and we can have hope for them and we can be willing to forgive them and be looking for opportunities to care for them. We can see their bad actions as in some ways like kind of like a, maybe not a cry for help, sometimes a cry for help, but maybe just a call for help, that there's something here that needs to be, we need to be concerned about and have compassion for. But when it comes to things like um, rational mistakes, like being ignorant, or um, operating under false assumptions, or not being sufficiently critical, or not having evidence to back up your view, or having false evidence, or being, you know, kind of making, making these kinds of rational mistakes, things about the intellectual world, about what we believe in and how we see things, I see much less compassion. There's much less understanding. It's just like, if you're ignorant, like, 
I don't want to talk to you. Like, those are the people who are screwing up this whole planet, you know, and like, we should just get them out of here. There's very, there's, I, I notice, and I can, again, I can be wrong about this, and I'm sure things are different in different places, but I've seen some asymmetry here about um, the kind of compassion we show to rational mistakes versus um, other kinds of moral mistakes. And in some ways, I think we're, we heavily moralize um, critical thinking. Uh, maybe not always with as much critical thinking or maybe a misguided view of what critical thinking is about. Um, but we will write those people off in a heartbeat or laugh them off um, or mock them um, without any compunction um, uh, publicly, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's concerning to me. Um, but there, I think that the ultimate product of those reflections is that it doesn't take much to jump from the kind of accountability that critical reasoning is asking for us to have of our beliefs and values and, mo and moralizing that and turning that into uh, an opportunity for uh, judgment, both of ourselves and of, the, of other people. The anxiety is not just that maybe other people will criticize us, but that just will, you can't hide from yourself. And if your self is condemning yourself and making you feel guilty and shameful about everything, then there's no place to run. So uh, we might try to uh, hedge the whole situation by just avoiding the opportunities that would give ammunition to those negative self-talk voices that are in our heads, our, all, our own personal demons. So I, I want to say that I, the, one of the big reasons why I wanted to talk about all this and spend so much time about it is that I think it's good to go into spaces, difficult spaces like uh, spaces of critical debate with compassion and understanding for the people that we're engaging with and that these are some of the factors that are behind it. The code of intellectual conduct is, you know, if we go back to this this lecture we had, right, and we had these good and bad things here, a lot of the bad things are things that aren't that hard to avoid. They're, they're things that, you know, we don't have to do when we're debating with each other or being critical reasoners. They're, they're, um, they're ways that we... Oh, bless you, buddy. Oh, bless you. That wasn't me. That was him this time. <laughs> Um, they're, they're kind of ways that we take a difficult situation and make it way worse. I, I like to label these other kinds of behaviors artificial sources of anxiety because they're just the product of how we behave with each other. Um, we don't have to yell at each other when we're presenting our case or making arguments. We don't have to do that. We don't have to make personal attacks on each other. Uh, we don't have to be abusive in general. Those are all optional choices that we make. But And the code is supposed to help us in some ways by uh, help the situation of, of having these difficult discussions or these things that can be intimidating and stressful by just telling us, hey, don't do these things. Here are some guidelines for your behavior. But, but, I like to emphasize how even if we're able to protect against all of those artificial sources of anxiety, there still are some very natural and legitimate sources of anxiety that are that's connected with critical reasoning. It's not just like, oh, of course this is the ideal thing to do, so what's your problem? Why can't you get on board with this critical reasoning thing and just be vulnerable and throw yourself out there? They're, they're talking about this Tillich's different sources of anxiety about non-being and connecting them with critical reasoning, um, I think gives us a pretty good platform uh, of why we'd be justified in being a little sensitive and compassionate about this. Um, I don't think, I've been hearing this discussion and debate a lot recently about people being concerned about sensitivity and having tough discussions and stuff like that. I don't see there being any kind of conflict between critical and robust truth seeking and being sensitive and respectful to people. In other words, if I'm advocating here for a kind of sensitivity, that's not a sensitivity that says don't criticize the things that need to be criticized. But it is about how do we go about that. And maybe in some cases not making that choice or doing things in a slightly different way. But the goal here, the picture we're kind of trying to paint with the Code of Intellectual Conduct and all this sort of reflection, critical reflection on critical reasoning, is how do we get all these good things? We need to have critical discussion if we're going to pursue the truth and if we're going to hold our own beliefs accountable and test them and make sure that they're really the best ones that we can have. Um, that's all important, and we don't need to sacrifice that. Um, but that, that's my claim. We don't need to sacrifice that activity um, for the sake of being nice to people. But we can still be respectful. There's no conflict here. The ethical and truth-seeking components, like the code talks about, I think that they, they map perfectly onto each other. Um, and there's not a risk that we have to sacrifice one for the sake of the other. 
Um, so it's important to be sensitive, I think. Um, there are the oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention about this. So the code definitely helps with saying like, don't do these things that make things way worse than they have to be when it comes to having tough discussions. Um, but also, uh, and so there still remains these natural sources of anxiety. But this is the other thing about the code. If you take a look at it, um, it doesn't just uh, put these fences up to make us avoid or to help us avoid doing these bad practices. But it also, if we're doing it right and we're doing it sincerely, it's a way in which we can also support each other in confronting these natural sources of anxiety. That's another um, potential benefit here. So um, we're, it's not like um, we're all alone in shouldering our own responsibility when it comes to uh, dealing with the confrontations with anxiety that critical debate can provoke in us. It's not like you do your, I'm doing my part, why aren't you doing your part? Why is this such a big deal to you? Why are you so sensitive? I mean, that kind of indignation is certainly inappropriate. But even if we didn't voice it, I think that mentality is the wrong one. It's not like, well, I'm I'm cool and I'm defending my position, and if you lose your cool and you can't defend your position, then I guess it just means I win. You know, it's not. It doesn't. It's kind of a passive aggressive. That's highly aggressive. Uh, still competitive model for debate. Um, so I want to avoid that too. I think that's important to avoid. Um, All right, I'm back. So to just finish this up, um, there's artificial and natural sources of anxiety about critical reasoning. I like to acknowledge this. It's a part of the human aspect of how we get into debate with each other. Code of intellectual conduct helps us, I think, try to get the good without the bad by telling us about which sort of behaviors to avoid and what positive things to do so that we can not make thing, not make an already tough situation worse. That's the removal of trying to dodge all these artificial sources of anxiety. But I think it also, if it's done properly and, and sincerely, gives us a platform to support each other in confronting this difficult space. Um, maybe you've heard people talk about creating a safe space, like a, like a group that is a safe space to discuss things. Um, things that maybe other times in other unsafe places people will publicly ridicule or shame you or, or silence you or things like that. You might want to have a safe space to be able to share your feelings and your thoughts and your experiences and that sort of thing. Um, I, like I said, I'm the, I'm the um, faculty advisor for the philosophy club at BC. And uh, I had another colleague of mine who was running another kind of discussion club, not on a philosophy club, but for something else. And I'm, I'm totally just stealing this from her because it's such a cool idea. I, got, I don't know, maybe she didn't invent it either. But she's like, we were having this like safe space, and, it, and people were frustrated because we weren't able to have the kind of difficult discussions that matter. People weren't allowed to disagree with each other and explore that. So she was like, let's try to create not just a safe space that is, we're going to avoid these kinds of negative behaviors like silencing people or something, disrespectful, shaming, that kind of stuff. Um, but also, what can we do to build a brave space, a space that encourages people to take risks um, and to try to um, head into some messier territory? And that's what critical debate's all about. I always describe philosophers as people who go looking for trouble. They're not interested in necessarily finding all these points of agreement. They're like, where's the controversy? How, what are the deepest things that we disagree about? And let's try to work out some of that thing. Let's try to get toward a kind of resolution of that disagreement, or at least figure out why, for reasons we can all understand, we can't resolve it. So um, we want to go looking for trouble, but as human beings, we've got limits. We have um, I love this uh, this idea, this concept of distress tolerance. All of us have a different level of distress or stress or anxiety that we can tolerate before we kind of freak out like he's doing. <laughs> His distress tolerance is overdone. Um, and it's not always just a choice of like, get over yourself or something. It's there, there are different circumstances that conspire to how we build up that distress tolerance. And we're not just alone in it. Um, it's something that we can help each other out with if we're working collaboratively and cooperatively in truth seeking. So that's that's all the that's that's the main stuff I wanted to talk about here to bridge the gap from from some of the intro stuff I was talking about and alluding to in my first lecture and the code of intellectual conduct lectures, which I hope you listen to or at least read that supplement. The supplements probably got more content than the video lectures do at this point because I just keep working on it and building it up and everything. 
All right, buddy, you good there? Use the mouse. Um, I did want to say a couple words about the rest of the intro lecture here. So if you go on past the point I told you to stop, there is this section called uh, James Obstacles and Virtues. This is from a colleague of mine from grad school. I lifted it from his critical reasoning class, and I think this is also good to look at. I, James is a little, like I say, he's a little harsher about this. Um, maybe a little bit more in that direction of like, like, come on, people, like. This is how we should do things. That's obviously not the right way to do things. It can be maybe it sound a little more judgmental or uh, I don't know, just just a little harsher than I would do it. But um, I have compassion for people, and we can still make mistakes. People and mistakes are different things. Um, we're not necessarily uh, defined in terms of our whether it's appropriateness to give us care and concern based on just how well do we perform at certain things that we want to do well including critical reasoning. So uh, James has this kind of, I think this material is still very useful. He's like, there's some things that get in the way of us thinking that critical reasoning is a good thing or that are just kind of counterproductive to it. That if we, if we do agree critical reasoning is a, a good way to proceed in a certain situation, what are the things that kind of challenge that that are the obstacles, like he puts it here, obstacles to critical reasoning? Uh, or things that we might use as a way to rationalize not using critical reasoning tools. So some of these are more intentional and some of them are more psychological that can happen in our subconscious. I, I recommend taking a look at all this. I think these are all good things to have on the radar, concerns to have. Um, and so I, I recommend that, although <clears throat> I'm not going to go through and, and lecture on this stuff either. So there you have it. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll sign off now. Uh, the code, I got to give you the code. I just forgot about it until now. Um, let's do the code, uh, well, in, in honor of his first appearance on YouTube, here, say hi to the people, he's totally dead asleep right now, um, let's have the code be, we'll have the code be Luke, that's his name, so that's the code this time around, um, I hope this wasn't too distracting, if it was too distracting, me bouncing and bopping this baby around, uh, please send me a comment or email or something like that to let me know that that was the case, and I will avoid this in the future. I uh, just kind of worked out that this was, uh, I wanted to get this done as quickly as possible, and, and my poor partner has been uh, awake for so long, so um, I wanted to make sure that they were able to get some sleep. Um, so that's what happened. But let me know if it doesn't work out, and the code is Luke, so you can put that in the quiz. Um, and I will post this, and this will be up shortly, and I will not delete it this time. So uh, thank you for watching, and uh, I'll have those. Um, I'll be working to get those videos for the second module up just as soon as possible. I promised Wednesday, tomorrow. I will try to hit that, see how it goes. It might be late on Wednesday. We'll see. Um, but if it's not Wednesday, it'll be Thursday for sure. So again, I, I just want to say thank you for your patience in, in me getting this all set up. It's been a little rockier start than I was hoping for. Um, I just found out that I was going to be teaching this class online about the uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday last week, so it's been kind of a short turnaround trying to get everything up and running, and I appreciate your patience with it. Um, I hope it's serving your needs well so far. Um, please let me know. I mean, I guess it, certainly if, you've, if, you, if it's been rough, if you've had a problem with it, I'd like to know about that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to write it off as just you complaining or something. I, I honestly invite that, and I'd like to know. And I guess if it's been fine, too, if it's not really been that big of a deal, that'd be nice to know, too. But um, give me feedback as, as you want. I'll, that goes for the whole quarter, too. Um, I'm definitely open to receiving feedback about how this is going. Um, it is a little bit of an experiment, and I'm going to try out some things, and we'll see how they go, and maybe can make some adjustments along the way, too. So be in contact with me. Um, I'll be in contact with you um, and more updates soon.